So I am Tom. I'm not the normal guy who's up here. He called me about a week and a half ago, and he said, hey, are you going to be around on the 4th? <laughs> yeah. Good. Diana wants to go on vacation. And I was like, good, where are we going? <laughs> it's not how it went. Apparently, she wanted to go on vacation with him, and I got to do this today, which is fine. I, uh, I love stepping out of my comfort zone. I'm not comfortable up here. But that's good, too. And we all need to step out of our comfort zone from time to time. I will say this, though. I said yes very quickly because I thought I was going on vacation, and Ralph was speechless. If you've ever seen that, I didn't think anybody had either. Today, uh, I've got a few things. i, I got to tell you, God's, God's amazing. He's so amazing. And I say that because had I shared what I was going to talk about today with the worship team, I don't know that they could have picked a better set of worship songs for this. And the same thing happened to us last week. I came out of our class. I, I, I teach the Grove. And you can kind of see some crazy stuff that we've been doing here recently. Uh, up here last weekend, we had, the, for the first time since, uh, since COVID, we had a chance to get out of the building. Um, we've been meeting. We really didn't take much of a break. None of our youth did. Uh, we felt that uh, our youth needed to get together, needed to experience God together uh, instead of sitting at home waiting and watching videos. And we've been meeting at the church and doing a lot of fun stuff, but every once in a while we get a chance to, to take them out and do things like this and just go pour it out. I don't think many of you realize how, I know I did for a long time until I started working in, middle school and junior high youth ministries. How much love for God they have. How much naturally they pour it out into everything that they do. It doesn't mean they're always successful. It doesn't mean that they don't do crazy things. What it does mean, though, is they're well on their way to making an agreement. That agreement to trust God, to follow Jesus, and to share him and pour him out wherever they go. Don't let that be lost. We tend to look down sometimes. We tend to act like they shouldn't be heard. I don't think we do that here. Kids are very important in our church, but it happens. And I hope that us doing crazy stuff like this, oh, by the way, I was fast. I was the fastest. I, I still compete with them. I'm here to beat them every time I get a chance to. It's getting a little harder the older I get, but I'm here to win. <laughs> but I tell you what, we hadn't laughed like that in a while. And then later in the day, we had a chance to go to the Roberson family home. They invited us out. We got to burn some hot dogs. Some of them really did burn. A few marshmallows were on fire. If you ever want a perfect marshmallow, Travis Morris can roast the best marshmallow I've ever seen. I didn't even eat it, and I was like, ooh, that thing is awesome. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm told that that's a certain love language he has. I, don't, I didn't quite understand that. So in this group, as, as the shameless plug for all of our fifth through eighth graders, we have a good time. We meet every other week on a Sunday evening. We come here, we eat a little food. I pour it out to my wife. She, she keeps us on track. Um, we come, we meet right in the, yes, please, yes. Um, and if you can imagine, I'm tough to wrangle sometimes. But she, uh, she comes, she takes care of keeping us on track, takes care of all the things that don't necessarily, wouldn't get done. And uh, junior high ministry is not necessarily her love, but she loves me, so she sticks it out most of the time. So we went, we did, uh, we played, we met up with the port. This was kind of uh, uh, our kick in the butt party is what I call it. It's that time where our eighth graders are going to have their final meeting with us and we send them on to the port and we like to introduce them and the, the port was gracious enough to, uh, uh, to invite them in and, and take good care of us and they only took a three or four of my kids and put them in a section of culvert and rolled them down a hill. I'm told that's normal. But it was good. It was good. I didn't get any pictures of that because I was too busy laughing and I was afraid my phone was going to get destroyed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about agreements today. We're going to talk about the agreement that us as Christians know very well, but 
that walk that we have with each other is not always easy for other people to see or understand. I had the, the gracious experience as I walked in today, probably a little green, a little more comfortable now. I'm up here. You guys haven't thrown anything at me yet. Um, but Dan saw me at the back, and he pulled me aside. He said, do you mind if I pray with you? And I said, absolutely. And then Audra, a beautiful prayer too, uh, because this isn't my normal. I'm thankful for Travis. He threw an extra song in <laughs> so that uh, I didn't have to fill. Yeah, we're not going to make it that long. Um, but if you would pray with me, yeah, <laughs> if you would pray with me as we, uh, as we get started here today. Our Father in heaven, we, we humble ourselves this morning. God, we've come here on this day of celebration here in, in this world that we come and, and we celebrate not, our, not only our freedoms here in this land, but our freedoms that we know are yet to come. Our love for you, Father, and your Son, who, who humbly gave himself on that cross, gave up all of his, his abilities to do the things that you do, God, to come here and walk and feel how we feel and know how we will react. God, he did that for us so that, uh, so that our sins would be covered from you, that we can one day know what it is to be in heaven. God, we anxiously await our chance to be at your right hand. And Father, we pray that as we live here and do the things that are needed to be Christ-like, that we follow, we love, and we lead. God, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So staying whole. There's a, uh, we talk about agreements and what happens when an agreement fails and where it goes to and why it goes there. And I got to be just uh, up front with you. I've probably written this sermon. I don't even know what to call it. I'm not, I don't consider myself a preacher. But consider, considering this, I, I've probably written it five times in the last 12 hours. Not including the ones I wrote early in the week. You know, he gave me a week and a half, which is, uh, which is gracious because I was completely down another path. And, and I got to last week and I was in class and the Grove, we're at that point where we've pulled the New Believers Bible back out. And we've started that. We've, we roll on a, on a two-year cycle now. And that's, that takes about two years by the time we take all of our breaks and things like that. And we, we were talking, um, and at the end of the day, we were talking very early on and, and what the problem is, and that's sin. And sin comes from us. And that's a broken agreement. That agreement was broken all the way back in the garden. And last week, we were talking about those things, and, and after class, one of them, they come to me and they go, are you directing that to me? <laughs> I said, no, no, I don't have that kind of gift. <laughs> I barely know what's directed at me most of the time. <laughs> but it hit me that it's likely a broken agreement. It may not even be their broken agreement. It may be a broken agreement from someone else in their life. We often try to find those parts to those agreements when they don't fit how we feel. We try to find those pieces, those parts, what's causing that to be broken. Whether it be marriage, a legal contract, a work contract, a friend contract? What's missing when it starts to fail? What's replaced what was right and true in the beginning? What fills that? Why do we seek those things that don't matter? Why do we fill them up and replace them with things that shouldn't be there? The lesson today, one of many titles was, why am I always hungry? 
to staying whole. And we're going to go with staying whole today. And as I share this with you today, trust me, I got enough going on in my own life. I'm not pointing fingers at you. This is all for me. This is all for me. Because each and every day I wake up and I break my, my agreements. I sin. I sin. One of my favorite non-Bible stories, I'm back in the early 90s. Believe it or not, I, I was introduced to this story when I was probably 13. I don't know why it stuck with me 20 years later. It stuck with me very well. It's a story that Stephen Covey in the Franklin Covey series, I, I'm one of those guys that had a plan. I still have a thousand of them laying around, but annual planners that I'd write everything in, and it would tell me where to go, how to get there, and when to do it. But Stephen Covey shared a story about an agreement, an agreement that was a win-win, if you've ever heard that. He shares that with all of his, or, or did share that with all of his, um, his lessons, that the perfect agreement is a win-win. And it's the story that he shares with, about his son, a young son. It's called Green and Clean. I'm not going to share Green and Clean with you today. I'm going to give you a, kind of the premise around it, but uh, it's a great story. If you have time to look it up, I'd go YouTube it. He tells it so much better than I ever will. Uh, but it stuck with me at a young, young age. Green and Clean is talking about his yard. Any of you have a yard that you are obsessed about? I'm not there yet. I've just figured out how to mow stripes. But he just wanted a yard that was green and that was clean. And he had kids. And if you know anything about having kids, green and clean is not always easy. But he asked one of his children to enter in an agreement with him that was green and clean. And he said, I don't care how you make it green and clean. I can tell you what I would do, but I don't care how you do it. So he goes on and he delivers this example. They talk through it, and the son takes a couple of days, and he says, yes, I'll do it. He wasn't as excited as I might have been right there. But he says, I'll do it. Dad says, great, green and clean. How do we get there? This is green, that's clean. Who manages you? I manage myself, who helps you? Dad, you help me. That's the premise. He then goes on. Stephen walks away, he goes to do his job. Saturday and Sunday go by, young man, nothing. Monday, nothing. Tuesday, going to work, dad's upset because the yard is not good. He goes to work, he comes home, he finds his son playing. He says, oh, it's still not good. I ask him, how's he doing? How's it going, son? Not good, dad. Well, what's wrong? It's hard. Stephen's like, what's hard? You haven't done anything. At that moment, he says, what do you need, son? I need help, dad. Well, who's your helper? You are, dad. Well, then let's go. I got time now. He says, okay. I go through this story. They grab bags. They go. They help. It's all done. At that moment, at that very moment, Stephen says that his son side signed the win-win agreement. Why is this important today? Here's why. How many times do we invite to church? How many times do we say, come to church? How many times do we say, great, you're at church? But then we just leave. We got you in the seat, and we just walk away. You've said you love Jesus. You're doing what looks right. But like the son in Stephen's story, are they fully in agree? Do they understand it? Do they know that we have a part of our own side of this agreement to uphold? The first part's easy. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, he died for me. 
Yes, I've repented. Yes, I've been baptized. It doesn't end. It doesn't end because we're sinners. Born into sin. It's natural to us. We seek things that comfort us. And we fill that distance, that void, with things that don't matter. Little things. I know for me, I am famous for that. You want to know how I know that? When our pandemic started, everything stopped. I had to sit at home. I had to wait for something to do. That had never been a problem for me. So I stopped everything. I did what I was told to do. And I did the next best thing. I dove into my Bible. It's a habit I formed. It was a habit that I didn't really have a form before. But every day, I'm in here. But Tom, what's that mean about about an agreement? You made an agreement and you kept it. That's right. I did. But as things have lifted slowly and slowly and surely, I have added so much stuff to my plate. Someone calls, yep, I'm there. Need this done? Yep, let's do it. Want to meet on this weekly? Let's do it. Filling so many things in that my time with God, which was an hour really early in the morning, has slowly become 45 minutes, half hour, 20 minutes. I think everybody here would nod that this is more important. But yet even I not that I'm anything, I've just loaded things on top of this. And when I load those things on top, I get grumpy. Not for the right reasons, but I get grumpy because there's separation. Separation from me, from what makes, what makes my decisions valuable. And I think that's a lot of what's going on around me. Many of us had to stop doing all the extracurricular stuff, and we found out that we know how to talk to each other. Sure, we still had Facebook and Instagram and all those things that keep us connected. I don't even know. I, was, I don't even feel connected to that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But we, as a, as a leadership, said, we're going to open the church. We're going to make sure that people are staying connected, and I think we've done a decent job of that. But overall, our lives, we've let things in again that have separated us, that have made us not whole. Jesus made us whole, gave us a way to Christ. Sorry, gave us a way to God through Christ. He said, here's my son. He's done He's lived. He knows what you feel exponentially. And now he's going to die on that cross for you. Sent to fill a hole after we become unwhole. Or even unholy. When we try to fill those things, generally with sin, drugs, food. Things get off kilter. We get sideways. Suddenly we're agitated. Suddenly we don't know where those pieces fit. Funny story about my son. Everybody know those little shaped balls when they're red and blue? I think we have one in our nursery now. When he was little, mind you, he wants to be an engineer. 
When he was little, that little red ball used to make him so mad. He'd take the wrong size shape and just try to shove it in every, and it didn't work. And we do that. We do that with our spiritual lives. We're trying to find things that feel good, similar. Last week, Ralph said, if it's easy, stop. I've always thought that if it was easy, that was God's will. Because that's what the world wants us to know. It's what Satan wants us to know. So when Ralph said, hey, Tom, what are you doing on the 4th? I knew what he wanted. And I knew this wouldn't be easy for me. It's not. But I could have plugged something else in that didn't fit. I don't know what today would have been like. But we go all the way back. We go back to Jesus' tomb. And I got to tell you, I don't know if I'm stretching here or not, but this just fit right to me. And we take Jesus and, and, and Mary Magdalene shows up the next morning. And, and uh, you know, for, and John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, now this, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. The stone fill in the hole where Jesus was had been taken away. Been taken away by God. We need him to take that stone away that doesn't fit and put Jesus because that's what fits. That's what is in our hearts that's missing. That is what, when we become separated, we try to fill with anything but because it feels good. And we know that stone was placed there because the high priests and the Pharisees didn't want fulfillment that Jesus said he would be raised again in three days. Nobody wanted that. Well, they didn't, we did. Because it took away power from them. I imagine that many of us have those feelings. And if we don't, we know somebody who does. We know somebody who does. 40% of the U.S. adults are dealing with some sort of addiction or depression, or suicidal thoughts. 40%. It's a lot of us. I can't help but think that that's got to do with the fact that we are trying to put the wrong size shape in the wrong size hole. Filling those voids with stuff to do, places to go, people to see, that's not, that's not going to fill the broken love and trust. God created an agreement with us that is a win-win agreement. That win-win is his son protecting us, protecting God from our sins. All we have to do is choose to follow God, to choose to follow Jesus. This isn't new. <laughs> this isn't new at all. If you would, if you had them, let's look at Exodus 32. In Exodus 32, one of the first things that happens, there's a delay. A delay. How do we deal with delays today? Everybody on their phone. I'm hoping, praying, that we're all looking at, looking at uh, our Bible apps, but we're not. I don't even do that. 
I said that like I expected to do that. I don't do that. Moses had gone up on the mount to meet with God, and he was delayed. He was up to get the tablets, the first tablet. <laughs> he was up to get the tablets, but he was delayed. What did the people do? They immediately started wanting to fill that void of God. And they convinced Aaron to build a golden calf. That didn't sit well with God. He was actually very angry. Very angry. Exodus 32, here we go. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this, Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are, our go these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He then went on to build an altar for him. God's reaction to this wasn't very good. Verse 9 it says, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen the people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and, my, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. It's not the first time. We're going to continue to make a mess out of our lives, too. How about Thomas and John? Jesus, risen, meeting with the apostles, and they're all kind of taken back. Thomas had to fill the hole. He had to feel in the wrist. Because we're stiff-necked people. We're stiff. We don't know how to study and learn that God is who fills that spot, that Jesus came for us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 through 25, I'm going to do this more often. I'm going to have to get me some of them electronic devices. Twenty-four and twenty-five. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die, to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He sent Christ because he knew that we would never be able to hold up to any of the laws, to uphold our side of the agreement. The win-win comes from both, comes from God. And all we can do is accept that, share that, pour it out. Paul tells us uh, in his letter to the church at Philippi how he deals with stress, loss, imprisonment. Matter of fact, he was in prison. how our circumstances don't dictate feeling. It's our choice to feel sad and down. Now some of us, some of us do feel that way. 
and there's something that we have to take care of medically. But even with today's medicine, we still need God. We still need God. And there's so many things that let us down that we have no control over. But it's not God. It's everything but God. It's the people we surround ourselves with. So here's how, here's how Paul deals with it. We'll be in uh, Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be in 8 through 20. And this is my favorite verses. Again, probably one of the earliest verses that uh, I learned after becoming a Christian and was shared with me multiple times. It's a uh, it's definitely one of the, the verses that is easy to lean on. But there's part in here that I used to think meant one thing, and then I realized, no, it doesn't mean that. I'm going to talk about that when we get there. Starting in verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. When things are going bad for me, I don't dwell on the good. When things go wrong at work, I don't dwell on the good. I dwell on what I've got to do to fix it. When things aren't right at home, I dwell on what I have to do to fix it. Not on the things that are good and pure. We go on. In verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now, this is Paul being thankful. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have re revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. He didn't need anything. God provided everything for Paul, and Paul lived and died on that. For I learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I don't like that word, content. I'm rarely content. Looking at the next best thing. A little less now that I'm older. But boy, when I was young, that's all I could think about. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to be abound. To any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance. In need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Boy, we overuse that one, don't we? It's not about needing more. It's not about conquering something. It's about knowing that it's all done. The agreement is fulfilled. All we have to do is accept it. All we have to do is accept it. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. Now that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to the, I'm going to butcher this, Epaphrodites and the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He's thankful. He's thankful. In a time of despair, he's thankful. It's still lost on me. Strong man. an agreement that we 
get to choose. It's an agreement that we need to share with everyone we know. It's an agreement that we have nothing to give. Nothing to give. Ladies and gentlemen, as I wrap today this up, I, I just pray that I just pray that we pour it out like, like the song said today. That what we learn, we don't keep to ourselves. That we go and we share this agreement that we've been given like we've been called to do. Go and make disciples of all men. I appreciate all of your attention today. Before I, before I close this up in prayer, I know that Ralph would be uh, amiss if I didn't mention that there are cards. If you need to connect with us in any way, please fill one of those out. We should actually put some digital ones in there so that you can take a picture of yourself so that Ralph can start working on his name game. I'm very thankful for Ralph and all that he does up here. This isn't uh, Ann Travis and our worship team. Yeah, amen. They bring the word each and every week and give it to us on a plate, wrapped, ready to go. And I just pray that we don't take it home and use it as leftovers, that we go and we give it out. 